Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Psychology Online's webinar, written and presented by Professor Jamie Hacker-Hughes, whose specialist expertise is in military and veteran mental health. Um, I'd like to ask you to, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screens, and we'll have a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. So now I'm going to pass over to Jamie, who will be presenting Maintaining the Mental Health of Military Personnel, Veterans and Their Families. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you very much, Steph, uh, and thank you very much for joining me. Um, I hope that you've either had your lunches or that you've got your sandwiches with you. Um, there are going to be lots of slides in this presentation because there's an awful lot to cover. So I'm going to be batting through the slides at quite a rate. Um, and what I'd ask you to do, or what I'd suggest that you do, is really just listen to what I say uh, and, uh, and take the information on the slides in uh, subliminally, as it were. Um, and then at the end, in the 15-minute question and answer session, once you've done any questions as they arise through to Steph, as she's just explained, um, then I'll look forward to, to answering your questions and interacting with you, if only virtually, then. So I'm going to talk about uh, the mental health of military personnel, veterans and their families, and we're going to start with a historical overview of military mental health before looking at uh, research into British military mental health over recent years. Uh, now I'm going to go on to describe what's in place in terms of uh, military mental health support for service personnel and their families. Um, and then we're going to look specifically at veterans and providing services for veterans uh, and their families before finishing. And the real point is that there really is nothing new under the sun. Um, I always to tell every, used to tell everybody that the earliest uh, documented account of uh, post-traumatic stress or, or psychological problems um, was the Battle of Marathon. But no, not at all. I'm working with a colleague and we've written a paper where we've actually looked at the writings found on uh, cuneiform tablets which describe symptoms very akin to what we'd now call, uh, call post-traumatic stress disorder uh, back in 3200 BC, back in ancient Mesopotamia. That's a very, very long time ago. Um, and yes, there are the accounts of um, Herodotus writing about the Battle of Marathon in 490 uh, BC. And he wrote uh, particularly about a spear carrier called uh, Epizalus, who developed a psychogenic blindness, despite the fact that, as Herodotus says, he was neither harmed by, by sword or, or, or spear. He was totally unharmed in the battle but became psychogenically blind in the battle. And there's the quote. He continued blinded as long as he, he lived, and Hudson wrote about that in, in, in 1990. Now Shakespeare, um, I don't know how he knew about uh, post-traumatic stress, but he certainly did, because when he wrote Henry IV, part one, um, he describes the character of Harry Percy, uh, otherwise known as Hotspur. Uh, and Hotspur has a pretty classic DSM uh, diagnostic set of the criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, this is the statue of, uh, of Henry Percy. Um, and there's a, uh, a, a spell in the play where Hotspur's wife says to him, you know, why are you doing all these things? So she describes uh, classic avoidance symptoms. She describes classic re-experiencing symptoms, nightmares, shouting out in his sleep. She describes hypervigilance. And I, I love this line, uh, that beads of sweat have stood upon the brow like, bubbled, like bubbles in a late disturbed stream. Uh, so uh, please, uh, none of you write a book with that title, because I, I really like it. Um, so all, all of these um, symptoms are, are very clearly described in this, this uh, piece of Shakespeare, Henry IV, uh, part one, um, by Hotspur's wife. Coming more up to date, um, in the 17th century, Thirty Years' War 
um, again, we have got military um, um, psychological symptoms. Um, uh, Simon Wesley and Edgar Jones have written quite a lot about this in their book, Shell Shock to PTSD. Um, but in the Thirty Years' War, they described in the Spanish army something called Mala Corazon, which apparently was a state of de deep despair, uh, which conscripts experience, or estarotto, which means to be broken. Uh, and a number of people were discharged with what we now call temperamental unsuitability from the Spanish army um, with, 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 with very, very much you know, a psychological rather than a physical condition. Similarly, um, Hofer uh, and Schweitzer both wrote about Swiss mercenaries suffering from what they, um, they called respectively either Heimweh, homesickness, or Melody du Pay, sickness for one's, for one's country. Um, and these were symptoms of, uh, of depression, uh, but also cardiac symptoms, um, loss of appetite, um, and in some cases death, so they were really quite extreme, these symptoms. Um, and they were all attributed, uh, quite amusingly really, looking back on it now, to the um, increase in atmospheric pressure that the Swiss mercenaries uh, obviously experienced when they, they came down from their uh, the Alpine homes um, to fight um, battles in the Thirty Years and other wars uh, on the plains of Europe. So moving closer to the present day, we then have the uh, American Civil War. And the American Surgeon General, William Hammond, uh, wrote about a thing called nostalgia. Again, very similar to what we talked about earlier on, uh, the Malacorazon and the Heimwehr and the homesickness, um, due to unsuitable and hasty enlistments. But also, there was this thing called Da Costa Syndrome. Now, da Costa Syndrome or irritable heart, effort syndrome, soldier's heart. It's very interesting because it's a cardiac symptom um, and people were, the, the syndrome, people were coming up with some very definite cardiac uh, symptoms with no apparent explanation. There's no apparent explanation. All, all, all sorts of explanations were given. One of the explanations that was given was that it was the weight of, of the kit in the webbing and the pack um, pressing on the soldier's chest through, um, through the packs. Um, but um, because of the weight of the packs, but nothing could be could be found out about this. Uh, and yet again, it was very much deemed to be a, a psychological um, a syndrome, um, and a psychiatric diagnosis could could always be made. Moving into this century, uh, in World War One, we know a lot about what what happened. It's the beginnings of British uh, psychology with uh, C.S. Myers, there were, we really only hear about two groups, which I'll refer to later on, but in fact, thousands upon thousands upon thousands were evacuated back from the front um, to field hospitals and casualty clearing stations on the French shore, and NYDN hospitals, not yet diagnosed uh, neurological, which meant just that, they hadn't been diagnosed as neurological, so they were sitting in a hospital waiting to be treated and they were seen by psychiatrists, and neurologists, uh, and the first psychologists. And then there again there was again a, another cardiac symptom, um, disordered action of the heart, uh, very similar to the, the to the Costa syndrome that we've just talked about. But again, no physical cause could be um, found for this. And um, Edgar Jones, in particular, from King's College London, who's an expert in the history of military psychiatry, has written. Uh, at length about this. Um, the doctrine of Pi uh, was originated uh, in the First World War. It was originated by the visit uh, of the American psychiatrist um, Thomas Salmon to France when America joined uh, towards the end of the war. And Pi stands for proximity and immediacy and expectancy. And it's still applied by our field mental health teams. We've got three mental health uh, nurses out in Afghanistan at the moment. Where possible, they try and keep people as close as possible to where they've been serving. They see them as quickly as possible. And there's an expectation that people will get better and return to duty. 
and indeed that's exactly what happened up to 40 to 80 percent of shell shock cases made their way back to to combat duty in the trenches and on the front lines in the first world war these however are one of the two groups we do hear about um, shot at dawn we hear about those people who developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, who just couldn't face fighting uh, in the front whose actions were taken as cowardice and mutiny uh, and were shot at dawn and not long ago a shot at dawn um, memorial um, a very moving one was erected if you haven't already seen it at the national memorial arboretum uh, near litchfield and the other group we hear a lot about is the group of shell shock. Shell shock was thought to be due to the concussive, concussive effects of uh, artillery air bursts uh, on the central nervous system. And all you need to do is to go on to Google, Google um, shell shock, and you'll be able to see videos of this man and others being treated at places like the Royal Victoria Hospital down in Netley in Hampshire or um, uh, Bishop's Lydiate uh, down in, in, in Somerset or, or elsewhere. Um, and I think it's this particular individual, there's a noise and this poor man just cowers and rushes under the bed. And there are all sorts of tremors and the problems with gait and speech, which again, we now know would be totally psychological. Um, Officers generally better, got a better deal as they as they still do, uh, uh, not so much these days. Um, but um, the what's now the Napier University of Edinburgh was Craig Lockhart, and that's where uh, W. H. R. Rivers, the anthropologist and psychologist, treated both uh, Siegfried Sassoon um, and Wilfred Owen. Um, both seen, and uh, if you haven't seen the film Regeneration, um, it's described there. And that was one of the three books that, uh, that Pat Barker wrote on the subject. World War II, again, massive psychological effects. Um, great things were done in the British Army um, in the Second World War. Uh, a lot of very talented uh, psychiatrists were drafted into the military, Fuchs and Bjorn and Rickman. Um, and they worked at Mill Hill and Northfield. Uh, and there were wonderful de developments of group therapy and the Northfield experiment with very large groups of 100 plus people. And the other thing we hear about in World War II, of course, is LMF. Um, LMF was absolutely shocking. Um, it was lack of moral fibre and it was the term given to people like these people uh, in a Wellington bomber who just couldn't face uh, mission after mission after mission over occupied um, France or Belgium or, 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 or the Netherlands. And um, I, I myself have, uh, have treated uh, a, a flight engineer from a, a liberated bomber um, who was the only one by the end of the war of his initial crew of, as you can see there, eight or ten. Uh, the people were deemed to have a lack of, lack of moral fibre, they had to wear special stripes on their arms, lack of LMS stripes, uh, and they were basically sent off for, for psychological treatment, um, and they either came back um, or, 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 or just went away in disgrace. And then, of course, luckily the day finally, finally came. Vietnam War, and this is, um, it's not from a film, it's a, it's a, a picture taken by a war photographer, of an American sergeant, uh, absolutely exhausted, just having captured a Viet Cong objective. And of course, uh, really, this is where we see the birth of PTSD as such, um, where it developed from a gross stress reaction in, P in DSM-1, nothing in, PD in DSM-2, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, as such uh, in, um, in, um, in DSM-3 in 1980, um, DSM-3R, and then we all know about DSM-4, which came in in 1994, uh, and more recently, DSM-5, which came out in May of this year, uh, where there were these four diagnostic clusters rather than three now, re-experiencing avoidance, negative cognitions, and arousal, and they just shuffled the symptoms around, as you know. 
um, to create this third category of negative cognitions and mood. Now, a lot of research has been done over the last 25 years, primarily at King's College of London. This is the British soldier uh, in the first uh, Gulf uh, War of 1991. Uh, that's where the King Centre for Military uh, Health Research originated, looking at uh, the Gulf War syndrome. And they actually didn't find one. Uh, a lot of people came back with all sorts of complaints, but despite extensive research, they didn't. They found an increase in ill health, no unique uh, syndrome as such, no increase in cancer, no increase in mortality, uh, equal across all three services no influence of what people's role was or task was or duty was in theatre, except that, and this is in common with recent research, that the symptoms uh, were much more common in lower ranks uh, than in higher ranks. And then, of course, the British forces have been extremely busy ever since then. So this is um, a man in Afghanistan, uh, and um, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, again extensive research has, uh, has shown that uh, there is no Iraq war syndrome. What it's thought was is that um, it's been thought that the Iraq war or Gulf War syndrome was caused by uh, depleted uranium or the effects of anthrax or the, the effects of pesticides that were sprayed on the tents or the effects of uh, uh, anti-nerve agent um, um, uh, pills, still in a fairly experimental stage, some say, that, that, that people thought. Um, but um, as opposed to the Gulf War syndrome, where there definitely was a syndrome, uh, there was found to be no uh, equivalent Iraq or Afghanistan syndrome, according to Matthew Hossops and others research done at King's. Um, no substantial increase in mental health problems when people return home, unlike the states. Um, no matter what the phase of the um, engagement, whether it was the counterinsurgency uh, stage or the war fighting stage, the rates were stable. Um, but what we do, of course, know through uh, Freedom of Manus's uh, research that was given a lot of publicity last year, um, was that one thing that has been found is that uh, violent behaviour uh, has been prevalent uh, on people coming back from deployment um, and it's associated not just with exposure to trauma but also what people were like and how they were before they joined the military. Now generally uh, the UK are doing much better than the US, I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, We've um, only, there's no correlation, up until very recently, there wasn't a correlation with um, consecutive numbers of deployments. Um, I talked about post-traumatic stress because everyone thinks that that's the main problem. Of course, it's actually not. Uh, post-traumatic stress uh, is absolutely a consequence of deployment. It, it's by no means the major one. Um, the overall rate, according to King's, is 4%. Um, it's up to double that in the case of reservists. Reservists are, are especially at risk um, because often they are attached as singletons to, um, to formed units. And when they come back through decompression, they, they're, they're again not part of the main body um, and the treatment on, on demobilization when they get back to UK is different as well. Um, and, uh, and there are family uh, factors as well. Now, um, up until 2000, um, the British forces, like everybody else, practiced um, psychological debriefing, uh, critical incident stress debriefing, uh, and then, of course, a lot of uh, very negative um, uh, research came out about psychological debriefing, the Cochrane Review with Professor Suzanne Rose uh, and others. Um, in fact, my personal view is, and I'm, I've, I've gone uh, on record and I'll go on record again, is that actually most of the research that was cited to, um, to, to down um, psychological debriefing was actually inappropriate because it looked at uh, debriefing often being carried out by um, psychology assistants and uh, research assistants who had a very quick training and actually being applied to people like uh, road traffic accident victims um, and um, 
have been lifted of miscarriages rather than, than to the groups of people who who form together and train together and are debriefed together that, uh, that Mitchell originally intended. Nonetheless, in the light of that the, the research, the current Surgeon General, British Surgeon General, could do nothing other than ban it and trim uh, trauma risk management uh, developed by Norman Jones and Pete Roberts uh, was developed as Philip Stead. Uh, the, Nor the Royal Marines took it on first of all uh, and now all, all three services use it. Um, and the wonderful thing is that it's a peer assessment. So uh, trim practitioners are ordinary soldiers, sailors, aviators who are trained in these techniques and carry out a peer assessment and then refer on if necessary. Uh, the interesting thing is that there hasn't been any research so far to show that it works. People like it. Um, and um, well, that, well, that's about it really. Pe 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 people like it. Um, but anyway, that's what we have at the moment. Thirdly, de location decompression, whereby people don't return sort of straight from Camp Bastion to, to Basildon or Basingstoke, um, but come back via 36 hours in Cyprus. Um, we took that on, the British, British took that on, other people have been doing it before us, the Canadians and the Dutch. Uh, it's also very popular, um, but whether or not it, it, it's a really great benefit is, uh, is unclear. Battle mind is something that the Americans use. Uh, we tried it. We translated all the American English into British English, um, and, uh, and and no, it didn't. It didn't work over here, sadly. A big problem, of course, is the problem of stigma, um, because only a minority seek help because of the stigma of seeking medical help. Um, it used to be the case. I don't know if it still is. That the uh, the community mental, the field mental health team uh, out in out in theatre was always located round the back next to the you know, genital urinary medicine clinic, which in a way it's, it, 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 it's, it, it says it's all really because both are highly stigmatic services. Um, I'm sure that's not the case now, um, but only a minority seek help. Um, most people actually don't go to uh, mental health nurses and psychologists and psychiatrists. If they need help and they're out in theatre, they go to their mates, they go to their padre. If they're at home, they talk to their mates, they talk to the family. So stigma is a huge, huge, huge problem. The British Army is in the same way that MIND and SANE have big, fought big anti-stigma campaigns, uh, have uh, mounted this huge Don't Bottle It Up campaign. Um, and other charities have done the same, but they're only partially effective. Um, I'm just since, since I've got the opportunity to talk to you, I'm um, editing um, a book all about military mental health stigma, which is due out uh, next year, along with the um, filmmaker Mark Neville, um, who's making a film on the subject as well. But it's a huge, huge problem, and anything that we can do to, to combat it, um, you know, will, will help. I said that uh, post-traumatic stress isn't the biggest problem. It isn't. The biggest problem is um, probably adjustment disorders, um, which is that catch-all term, um, depression, um, and alcohol misuse. Alcohol misuse especially. Uh, the levels are higher than in the general population, especially binge drinking, especially amongst uh, young women. It is deployment related. It says risky driving. Um, in Iraq, actually, it, it was life-saving to drive along um, so very quickly in your Land Rover with, with the uh, sea spells uh, undone. Um, but there are all sorts of risky behaviours which come back after deployment. So how are things now? I'm just going to tell you about the current military mental health system. Now, the military are generally fit. They're young. They're healthy on uh, standard measures, such as the GHQ-12, the General Health Questionnaire. Uh, 12 items, 80% um, are below cutoffs, so they are generally healthy, of course, that means also that 20% are above cutoffs, but that's broadly in the equivalent to the civilian population. And many are, are, are below um, scores on comparable, um, of comparable occupations, such as firefighters and police officers and, and, and the like. For people who aren't deployed, the way that it's done at the moment is the people who really manage stress are commanders, uh, welfare and family officers, social workers like SAFA social workers, and what's called the chain of command. That's your corporal, that's your sergeant, that's your young officer, that's your sergeant major, that's your company commander, or obviously the equivalents in the, in the Navy and the Air Force. 
Um, and uh, what the um, overarching review of operational stress management in 2005 said, and I was part of that when I was um, uh, a senior lecturer at, um, at, at King's at the Academic Centre of Defence Mental Health at the time, was that um, people should get routine uh, doses of uh, stress management and psychoeducation when they join the services before, during and after they deploy, every time they get promoted uh, and before they leave. And there's very much a focus on the closure of the, the military's last psychiatric hospital in 2003 to, um, to a chain of command based system supported by community mental health, uh, mental health teams. And there's a para getting on a plane at, uh, at Bryce Norton. So it isn't just PCSD. PCSD is low. Stigma, of course, is a factor in that because people don't report it at the time and the um, PTSD rate in veterans through delayed onset or delayed acknowledgement or delayed help seeking is much higher. We found at King's that the rate was higher in medics, in reservists, which we've already talked about, and combatants, so people who've actually fired their weapon in anger and, 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 and been fired upon in anger and seen their mates uh, injured or killed, which unfortunately is very, very, very common, um, especially in Afghanistan at the moment. And it's much less common than, than depression and adjustment disorder and alcohol misuse, which you don't hear very often. So there's a, there's a military primary care system with uh, military doctors supported by welfare workers and uh, with, a, with a, a secondary department of community mental health backup. Um, there's a similar percentage of mental health related presentations in the military as in civilian life, interestingly. So in terms of departments of community mental health, there are 15 in the UK, four in Germany, one in Cyprus and the little baby one in Gibraltar, staffed by uniformed and civilian psychiatrists, community mental health nurses and uh, psychologists, clinical and counselling psychologists and mental health social workers, and each one looks after um, a county or so, so there will perhaps be a Navy or an Army or an Air Force team that will look after everybody from whatever service within their catchment area. And so this is where they are, uh, dark blue is uh, the Royal Navy, light blue is the Royal Air Force, and Army is red, the majority are red because half of the armed forces are Army with the RAF and the Air Force making up about a quarter each. And their aim, it's an occupational health service, a local service getting people back to, uh, to fitness uh, and very much carrying out psychological treatments based on NICE guidelines. The MAD slavishly follows NICE guidelines in terms of medication, but also in terms of uh, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, CBT, and also in terms of EMDR. And as part of their past qualification training, all mental health nurses uh, in the teams are trained to basic levels in, in CBT um, and, and, and EMDR uh, as well, which are used extensively throughout the military. Generally, the Marines uh, are better off in terms of mental health than the Navy, who are better off than the RAF, who are better off than the Army. Females are worse off than males. Other ranks are worse off than officers. Adjustment disorder is the most common diagnosis. PTSD is very rare, but higher in those who are deployed. If people do need admitting, there's now consortium of NHS trusts around the country where people can be admitted. Only a very small number you can see are, are admitted. They can be admitted very quickly. They normally stay for a short stay, less than 10 days now. Um, now, reservists, I said, are especially at risk. Um, when they are, when they're being called up, when they're mobilised, they get exactly the same access as everybody else. We've said that they've got higher risk of developing PTSD and other psychological problems. Um, in 2006, they established the government established a special reservist mental health program with art at a, the Reservist Training and Mobilisation Centre in Chilwell, between Nottingham and Derby. Um, uh, and Anyone who's served since 2003 whose problems are attributable to their service can be relocated there. Equally, the medical assessment program, which was run by Professor Ian Palmer at St Thomas's in London, uh, was accessible to anyone who'd served, anyone reserved or regular who'd served since 
1991, and that is now uh, co-located as the Veterans and Reservists Mental Health Pro Program up in up in uh, Chilwell. Field mental health teams, as I said, uh, out in theatre, wherever we're engaged in operations, we have uh, three or four uh, mental health nurses who don't just sit around in the main area, but they get out and about as much as they can, doing lots of briefings, doing lots of therapy, doing lots of treatments. If people really do need to be sent back, they're put on a plane from Camp Bastion, there's a big uh, landing strip on Camp Bastion now, uh, straight back to Bryce Norton. Uh, decompression, 36 hours, people leave theatre, they fly to um, Cyprus, they change out of their kit into sports kit, they have a morning worth of briefings, they have an afternoon just relaxing on the beach and doing various water sports, there's a barbecue in the evening and they get, get the uniforms back and they fly back the next morning and the nurses and padres are there as well. Um, rail 4, uh, Rail 1 is, is basically the, you know, the medic and the patrol and, and rail, rail 2 the dressing station, Rail 3 is the, uh, the hospital in Camp Bastion and Rail 4 is the Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre at Headley Court, the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. Um, if people are really ill, they go to Birmingham uh, where there's fantastic life-changing surgery that goes on there when they're so stable enough and their rehab really needs to move on, they then go to Headley Court and each one is staffed with psychiatrists and mental health nurses and psychologists. I talked about uh, them already. So veterans, well a veteran, the British government definition still, and they are looking at it, that it needs to change actually, but currently it is, a veteran is someone who served for one day or more in the armed forces. A male, their late twenties, they've been in about ten years, although by the time they get to combat stress, they're not, they're probably in their early forties. And there has been an interval between discharge and first contact of thirteen to fourteen years. Now that's not a, an interval between leaving the forces and going to their local GP, it's between leaving the forces and going to knock on the doors of combat stress, who the, the largest uh, ex-mental, uh, the mental welfare um, society, the largest um, sort of military um, uh, I think a lot of that is due hopefully to what has happened through Orison, a lot of it uh, through um, through the advent of TRIM um, and the um, accessibility of, um, of TRIM practitioners, a lot of it through the proactive mental health awareness done by the mental health teams and a lot of it through the battle against stigma. The majority still come from Northern Ireland, that's where the vast majority of our troops have deployed over the last 25 years, but also from the Balkans, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Iraq, Afghanistan and the Gulf. We're 5 million veterans in the UK, so with dependents, the, the veteran and dependent population is about 10 million. Um, uh, that, or 12 million, that's huge, that's 20% of the UK population and generally as a rule of thumb if you want to know what the veteran population is in your area it's 10% of the general population. There's a huge turnover, about 25,000 people leaving every year of which half will have served these days, so unlike the old days the Cold War when I was sitting out in, in my tank in Germany waiting for the Russians to come um, that's not the case anymore. Um, every six months and every two you're deployed and you're out in Afghanistan or, or Iraq or wherever. Um, I, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I hope you can't. Um, a very low percentage of regular service personnel are discharged um, for mental health reasons, but after service um, about a fifth do have mental health problems. Now that's no different to how they are during service. Delayed onset PTSD is a problem. Now whether or not it's delayed onset, <coughs> excuse me, or delayed presentation or delayed acknowledgement is a whole debate uh, which we could have elsewhere. Transition, the, pro the, pro the, progress of, the process of leaving the military back to civilian life is a huge issue. Younger veterans are very vulnerable. Early service leaders, people who leave during training, um, and shortly afterwards are very vulnerable. And even though the vast majority of, of veterans do well, um, ex-service personnel are particularly vulnerable to social exclusion and homelessness, 
involved with the criminal justice system. Um, I was yesterday um, at a briefing being given by the Centre for Mental Health, um, who are involved in a criminal justice uh, diversion um, system. Um, and there are you know, beginning to be um, schemes uh, looking at that, particularly for, for military veterans. People join the military often to get away from difficult domestic environments. Um, where where you know, unemployment is high, where jobs are scarce, uh, where things at home are rough. And of course, quite often when you leave the military, you're going back to that situation or worse. Now, we now have the armed covenant, the armed forces covenant and the military covenant. The military covenant came in 2010. Now we have the armed forces covenant, community covenant. And we do have a commitment to extra, extra support for veterans' mental health needs from the coalition government. One of the big things that happened was that this guy, um, Andrew Morrison, uh, MP, Dr. Andrew Morrison, he's a GP, um, he, I don't know if he still is, but he was uh, a Royal Navy Reservist uh, GP, and David Cameron asked him pretty soon after the coalition were elected to look at the whole issue of um, veterans uh, and also of rehabilitation. And it's Andrew Morrison that uh, came up with uh, this uh, this provision of AQP, any qualified providers, saying that follow-up and management should be as close to home as possible. He talked about stigma in his report, Fighting Fit. Um, now, of course, one of the um, things that have really uh, developed um, over the last few years has been uh, IAPT. Um, I worked for a year as a, as a clinical lead for an IAPT service in between the MAD and, and um, being back in academia where I am now. Uh, and there's a very good uh, positive practice report written by a number of experts in the field. And the main thing is what they said is that veterans should really, it should apply to all of us I suppose, be able to access mental health care through whichever route they feel most comfortable with. And I'm going to just come back to this later on. And that care should be specially tailored for veterans' needs. Because, you see, if, if you are a veteran um, and you've got problems with your housing, or you, you've got problems with your money, or you've got problems with your, 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 um, your, manage, your, your marriage or your relationships, and you've got uh, problems with, with transport, and you've got problems with stigma, then um, it's necessary to, to tailor is provided, and there are now some um, some uh, new veteran services. Um, there are numerous veteran services. Uh, there were initially pilot pro uh, projects um, in about uh, 1997. A number of uh, veterans pilot projects around the country, uh, but now there are veteran services all around the country. Some of which are primary care led. Um, such as uh, VVADS, uh, um, the Vulnerable Veteran and Adult uh, Dependents uh, Service up in the northeast. Some are secondary uh, care led, such as the All Worlds Veteran uh, Health Service in Wales, because of course England and Scotland and, um, and Wales and all of them will organise their services differently. Some of them are primarily care led, um, such as the North West Military Veterans Service. And some of them are a joint, a joint NHS, uh, MA, MAD third sector, uh, such as the um, Veterans First Service um, in Essex. I think I've talked about all of this. Yes, I have, so I can just... Oh, yes, now this is important. Um, if people have already begun their service, uh, their treatment uh, with the Military Mental Health Service, and they've been going to the Department of Community and Mental Health, then once they've left, they can carry on finishing off that treatment for up to six months after discharge. That only came in over the last few years. Enhanced mental health assessments only came in over the last few years. And the other thing um, that's come in over the last uh, few years is, um, as I said, the, uh, the Veterans and Reservists Mental Health Programme. If people are um, found to have problems attributable to their service, and they can be referred for uh, military mental health treatment as well. And then, of course, there's the third sector, 
uh, we've heard about combat about stress, and then there are the other, you know, there's the others for big five or six, the Royal British Legion, SAFA, BLESMA, the British Limbless Ex Servicemen's Association, Blind Veterans. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, veteran mental health charities, um, of whom about 180 provide services of one kind or another to military and veteran personnel. Combat stress is a, is a major one with three treatments in um, three treatment centres in Surrey and Shropshire and Ayrshire. And also now there are government funded uh, joint services. So um, there is a community outreach service. The government has funded combat stress mm -hmm. to uh, have uh, community based mental health professionals who work closely with uh, the, the trusts in their area. There is a 24 hour helpline. Um, uh, it's a combat stress helpline, but it's actually run by Rethink, the mental health provider. Uh, there is an excellent, and if I, if you haven't seen it, do have a look at it. Just uh, type in RCGP, Royal College of General Practitioners, in the Google e-learning package uh, to educate GPs on uh, you know, what a veteran looks like. Uh, and there's also the big white wall, which has been developed in conjunction with the Tavistock which is an online um, support service um, for, uh, for veterans um, and um, for serving personnel and, and their families. Um, I've talked about the uh, NHS uh, mental health services and I think the answer is that there is a case of good, bad and ugly. Um, there are some Absolutely innovative first class services, centres of excellence, where primary, secondary and tertiary care are all uh, integrated and where there's measurable outcomes. There is that, sadly, still a postcode lottery. There are some areas of the country which are uh, poorly provided for in terms of veteran services. Um, and parts of the country, well, the, the provision of veteran services um, could still do with, uh, with more uh, coordination. There are people like uh, David Russell in, in, in the Veterans Policy Unit in the Department of Health and his team and the, the Armed Forces teams in NHS England, but the, they were the first to acknowledge that there is the inequality in uh, equity of access and parity of, of quality. And there, is, there are some areas un, unserved. I've talked about this already. The challenge again is that only half of veterans seek help from the NHS and if they do, they don't make it through to specialist mental health services. And that's because of what Charles Hogue, the American military psychiatrist from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research called barriers to care. And barriers can exist on the part of the veteran, but also, of course, on the part of the provider. Um, and on both Sides really, lack of confidence, lack of confidence from the mental health professional or the GP, you know, do I know what to do with, with these people? Language barriers, I don't mean the language barriers as in international barriers, but, but the jargon, the military is awash with what they call TLAs, three, three letter acronyms, there's a lot and lot of jargon. And uh, some mental health professionals think, oh, well, if I don't understand the jargon, if I can't talk the language, then how can I help? And the answer is, of course, well, you can help uh, if you don't understand what, 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 what a bit of jargon means or what a TLA means. Um, just ask, uh, ask, and the veterans uh, will respect you for that. Uh, it is all a matter of, of cross-cultural issues between the military, which is definitely a culture, and the civilian, which is another culture. Um, and then partners. Well, when um, in the past, up until 1960, uh, I believe, um, uh, all uh, care um, for partners was taken care of by the military. Now it's taken care of by the NHS, unless you're overseas. So if you're in Germany, um, the, the military um, provide your health care. Um, if you're in Cyprus, um, Gibraltar, the military provide your health care. Everywhere else, uh, if you're a family, if you're, if you're a partner, you, you go to the NHS for your care. Now, there are unit welfare structures, and I've mentioned them, the unit welfare uh, officers. Um, the Navy and the Army and the RF, RAF have their own uh, welfare service. And there's also SAFA, the Sailor Soldiers and Air Force Families Association, which have their own uh, welfare services. 
the, the Navy Army and Air Force Families Association, which really advocates uh, for, um, for for their members, for the the families of service women um, and men. Um, and a lot of work is done with families, especially when people deploy, letting them know what happens uh, during the deployment, what is happening during the deployment, when people are due to come back. A lot of that communication takes place. The British Legion also plays a vital role. I would draw just one, one organisation to your attention. There's a wonderful little organisation called the Ripple Pond, and it's an organisation founded by the mother of a wounded um, serviceman. And um, they've set up these groups, uh, and they're self-help groups, really, where um, the partners and families of, uh, of the wounded can talk to each other and support each other. So how about the future? Well, um, there will always be uh, continued improvements to so the selection and support of military personnel. The support of military personnel in this country is, is very, very good indeed. There are improvements being made um, to selection processes. It is possible to select those people who aren't going to make it through selection or who are going to be, be, become unstuck later on. And a lot of work is being done on identifying and working with uh, early service leavers. Um, there are some tests that could easily be incorporated into uh, initial assessment, uh, which as I said, a fairly robust test which should, could, can can predict people who aren't to do so well. The battle against stigma I've also mentioned. Uh, and then the last thing, especially if you remember uh, the thing about veterans where I talked about uh, tailoring things to veteran situation, um, this should be, there could be, both for seven military personnel and veterans, a whole menu of ways of accessing therapy. The big white wall I've mentioned, face-to-face -face therapy, uh, in the departments of community mental health or CMHTs or any qualified provider I've mentioned. Uh, but these days we can be talking about uh, tele telephone therapy, we can be talking about Skype therapy, we can be talking about online therapy as part of a menu which is individually, individually tailored to veterans' needs. Um, and online therapy, I've just been talking a lot about this over the last couple of days, it's ideal because everyone these days has got a has got a, a tablet or a laptop or a, um, a, a notebook or an iPhone, and actually when they're on that, whether they're in theatre or at home, they could be doing anything on it. People don't know what they're doing. If they're checking their Facebook or looking at YouTube, actually you could be having a, a stigma-free um, session with your therapist online. Um, online therapy has been evaluated. There's an interesting uh, Lancet paper in 1999. Uh, which put nearly 300 people through, uh, uh, through an RCT uh, and found um, that actually the people who had online internet delivered therapy did very well. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, um, people like it. Um, I'm just trying to see, there's a quote here. It's unusual not having to look the therapist in the eye, but it makes me feel I can open up a lot more. Now, that's not used in the military at the moment. Um, in the NHS, um, Surrey, uh, the Mental Health um, Commissioning Group, um, have started using it. So you know, that and Skype uh, and Internet and the big white wall, they should all be part of the picture, both for military and veterans. My clock tells me it's time to finish, um, so that's what um, I've done. Um, I hope you found it uh, interesting. I look forward to answering your questions in a, uh, in a moment. There are some very key uh, references, uh, Matt Foss's writings uh, and, uh, and Simon Wesley's writings um, and Chris Bruin, um, as well as the British Legion, some excellent publications from, from them. But uh, anyway, for the moment, thank you uh, very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was very interesting. It's really interesting to hear more about a subject I personally don't know much on, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. We've had lots of very good questions. Um, we might not get through them all, but if we don't, then I might ask Jamie to send you a personal answer. Firstly, let's start with a question from Deirdre. She's asked, the British military has a reputation for stiff upper lip. Has this changed since the Gulf War? And if yes, in what tangible way? <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure, Deirdre, actually, how much it has changed. Um, 
No, no, I, I, no. I think the, the 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 tendency, very much in the military, the, the way you're socialised in the military, the way you're trained during basic training, uh, is exactly that uh, to maintain a stiff upper lip. Um, the battle against stigma uh, is the only thing that that I can see that might might change that. There will always be sergeant majors um, shouting uh, as as far as I can see into the future. No, that's disappointing, but we hope it will change. Um, what are the valid current scales currently used to measure measure PTSD, and where can we get them from? Janet asks. Okay. Um, well, the one the, there's the short scales, but the one that's the, that's used by the um, the King's Centre for Military Health Research is the uh, the PCLC, uh, Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Checklist, civilian version. Funny enough, there's the civilian version and the military version, but the civilian one is the one that most people use. Uh, there are other short scales. Some of them are, are free, uh, and you can. And, and access them free. Some of them you have to pay for. There's the post traumatic stress diagnostic scale of Edna Fo. I think you have to pay for that one. Um, uh, and then there are other things like the impact of events scale uh, revised, uh, which uh, is commonly uh, used and which a number of IAPT services use. Okay. Fergus asks Is there any known reason why Royal Marines and Army at are at opposite ends of the at-risk spectrum when their operational roles are broadly similar? Yes. Uh, selection, selection, selection. Um, everyone in the Royal Marines, whether you're in the band, whether you're a, a medic, whatever you do, you've got to go through Royal Marine selection to win the, the coveted green berry. Uh, it's a long, long process. In the paras, it's different. You, you can join... Um, a number of units and then go for P company selection. If you go to join in the parachute regiment, then it's likely you're going to have to do that anyway. So it's, so it's selection. Uh, and there's actually a difference in culture, Fergus. Um, I did my trim training down with the Royal Marines in Limpston uh, alongside Marines um, who were training to be trim practitioners. There is a cultural difference uh, between the Royal Marines uh, and the Army. And there may also be a difference in, in the sort of areas that they recruit from as well. Okay. Um, Robin is very interested to hear about adjustment feature. He says it makes sense, but um, as you say, um, it's a catch-all. So what are common responses to sufferers in the services? And if PE input dominates, what alternatives are there to that? Okay. Uh, yeah, adjustment disorder is a catch. Is a catch-all. So people have got some of the symptoms, but not sufficient symptoms to meet diagnostic criteria for um, post-traumatic stress or, 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 or whatever. Um, PE. Um, this is um, uh, prolonged exposure. Um, there are three major treatments um, for post-traumatic stress. Psychological treatments. Uh, so sort of currently, uh, EMDR high movement desensitization and uh, reprocessing, which is, has been uh, approved and um, it's recommended by not just NICE, but recently by the World Health Organization. Trauma-focused co cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, prolonged exposure, I'm going to say four actually, we do the version of that. Um, and then a thing called uh, CPT, cognitive processing therapy. Um, developed by Patty Rezik over in the States, uh, which is more um, attuned to complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the, um, the, the, uh, the, the prolonged exposure was developed by Edna Fur in the University of Pennsylvania originally, um, but Alan, Alan Peterson at uh, San Antonio, Texas is the main um, person uh, promulgating that at the moment. Hmm. Okay, Deborah, sorry I'm rushing through these but we've got lots of questions. Um, Deborah says, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Do you know whether there is a typical gender difference in veterans that seek psychiatric help? Yes, the gender difference is that the only reason, generally speaking, that the males seek mental health support is that their partners or wives can't stand it anymore. Um, 
were it not for that, I think there would be a gender difference. Mm. I don't actually know what, what the figures are, but I do know that most people actually make it, most veterans, or a significant number of them anyway, uh, they make contact with mental health services because it's their partners who, who urge them to, to do so. And some of them sometimes just make an appointment under false pretenses and pretend that they're going, whereas in fact the appointment's for their, their boyfriend or partner or husband. Interesting. Debbie asks, can you expand what you mean by tailored to the military and what do they need that is different? Um, I'm not quite sure when I use that phrase, um, and I, I, I shan't flick through all my slides <laughs> in front of all of you to, to, see, to see it. I think it's, a, it's a tailored to the individual needs. I think the thing, the thing is that um, uh, if, if you're in the military, I suppose you need, you need uh, accessible services, you need brief services, you need some structured services, which are all about getting you back into your occupational role. In terms of, of, of veterans, that it means the sort of things that I was talking about in my last few slides, about taking in fact, the fact you know, taking into account the fact that a person might have not just the experience of having been in the military, but transport problems and accommodation problems uh, and very major um, sort of stigma uh, problems. Uh, a bad answer. I can't quite remember the context that I said. Said it's the military. I'm afraid. No, I think that was good. I think that was a good answer. Um, Deirdre, again, what differences are there between the U.S. military psychosocial culture and that of U.K. military in terms of openness? Huge. Um, in the American um, system, there's the Veterans Administration. Um, that's a huge network of government provided hospitals for veterans up and down the nation. Um, you can only get into one of those if you've got a diagnosis, um, and that goes a long way to explaining not only diagnosis rates, um, but also um, the rates that people uh, have in, in coming forward. Because yes, we've got the, we, you know, we've all, all heard haven't we, about Obamacare, but as far as the veterans are concerned, there's, the, the, there's this excellent VA system, but you, you can only actually get into it with a diagnosis. And also, of course, they, I was thinking about this the other day, um, yeah, they have the Purple Heart, and you can have a Purple Heart, I think, for, uh, for psychological problems, whereas we don't. We just that's not the way it's done over the side of the Atlantic. Okay, fantastic. I think we're going to end on time. And I would just like to say thank you very much, Jamie, for a very interesting presentation. And it's great that you've um, you've helped Psychology Online with this. Um, if anybody that's attended would like to ask any further questions, please email them to info at psychologyonline.co.uk. And we will send you out a link to the webinar so you can view it again at your pleasure. So thank you very much for attending, and we're going to end now. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Steph. Pleasure.